right, thank you. All right, you can hear me. I'm impressed, you all. Black Hat, you made it till 4 p.m. I think the what the medium like number of party invites you got from vendors is what six or seven. So making it to 4 p.m. is 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 impressive, and I'm I feel blessed. So uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, zero trust. So if that's what you came here, you're in the right place. Uh, so a little introduction. My name's Dave Weston. I work on Windows security, um, which means anything you like about Windows security was probably my decision. Anything bad was somebody else, so that's generally how it goes. Um, in addition to trying to fix stuff, that's never an easy, easy task, uh, I have another team that breaks stuff, so there's kind of this tit for tat that kind of goes back and forth all the time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I became interested in, in zero trust. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump in. So the obvious question is, what is zero trust? And in reality, this is a massively overloaded term. Trying to find the actual definition of it um, is really difficult. It sounds cool though. You're like, I don't wanna trust anything. I have zero trust, I'm good. Sounds really impressive. But in, in reality, there's very few definitions of what's happening here. And I'll talk to you a little bit throughout this talk, but I think in reality, zero trust is not a product. It's not an architecture, it's more of a philosophy, similar to saying, I wanna sandbox everything or mandatory access control. So the reason, why did I get interested in ZTN? Well, besides all the security hipsters out there, and by hipsters and security, I actually mean this in a positive way. It's the people looking for new stuff, they're looking in the right directions, they're constantly saying, is there a better way? You know, I wanna use clouds with Chromebooks directly, I don't need antivirus. Um, you know, I don't wanna call anyone a security hipster, but I'll call out Chris Rolf. He's definitely a security hipster, I saw this a few times. And so my interest became, you know, these are smart people. Um, quite a few people, do you know Dizovi? I saw a lot of people saying, I wanna, I'm looking at Chromebooks, I'm looking at zero trust architectures, Google's paper on uh, BeyondCorp was, fascinating, you've got some other architectures being proposed. Um, it's a very kind of hip thing in the security space, so th there's some interest there. Um, generally though, when I hear a lot of buzz about something, I'm super skeptical. And when I show up at RSA and there's a truck that says zero trust, I'm really skeptical at that point, right? There's no free lunch. Uh, and even though I implement security software, my background's in attack, so it's always, what's the catch here? This, this can't work. However, I'm very, uh, you know, uh, I'm very into the zero trust mantra, I'm very skeptical, but Heather Atkins from Google, who I respect a lot, I trust her. Yeah, I saw her talk at RSA in a very open and transparent way about the transformative exercise of getting zero trust implemented to defend against adversaries at Google, and I said, okay, there might be something interesting there. Now the second reason I was interested is I work on device and OS security. And my life looks something like, I live five years or 10 years in the future. That's what all my friends tell me. You know, they'll mention an attack, I'm like, I've mitigated that two releases ago. They're like, people are still trying to update XP, man. Like, you're talking about hypervisor security? Come on. And so there's a reality to that, right? And occasionally I see, my, I see the error in my ways, which is, you know, I'll work with maybe a corporate red team and I'll give them a zero day exploit chain. And they'll kind of go like, I don't even need your, exploit chain, I'll find, the, I'll find the weakest part of the herd, I'll find the HVAC machine, I'll find that printer still running Sun OS 5 from 1989, and all you red teamers in here know that's exactly what you look for. You get the Nessus scan, you're like, oh, there's this printer that's not patched, there's this IP cam, and pretty soon you're moving throughout the network. And so, you know, as I'm actually giving people these, you know, million dollar exploit chains, they're like, we're good, we already sent the spear phishing mails, we dumped creds, we're good. What I started to realize is, you're not actually solving much at an individual device level. You've actually got to up level in terms of networks, and the reality is, you know, I'm not a network architecture person, but from an outside perspective, it seems to be moving slow. There isn't a ton of innovation. So, when I saw the concept of zero trust, which from my operating systems background matches up quite a bit. I, I think of it as mandatory access control, which is you know, principle of least privilege enforced on every process, no if, ands, or buts. Unless I know who you are, you're not getting access. You know, it kind of makes sense. And hopefully it, it so helps to solve that HVAC machine or that one user who got the exemption from MFA, which is always how the attackers come in. Uh, and it's, it's going to make sure that the weakest in the herd is still fairly substantial. The real question is, is how hard is that to do and how well does it work? 
So there's a couple other things that are going on I think are driving the massive interest in zero trust. The first is perimeter security models are whacked. When I can own your whole network because somebody in accounting clicked on a macro, it's just not working. Like, we need to rethink. And so I think a lot of people realize that. The second thing is BYOD and bringing all your devices means when you used to stack those 27 agents on the device where there's like four antiviruses and one DLP and the user's machine's now 40% slower, that can't happen when your users are bringing in, you know, iPads, iDevices, 10S devices, et cetera. So there's a lot of people saying, the way I used to do things, provision, you know, my 27 security agents, that's just not going to work. And I need that because of exhibit one around the, the softness of the endpoints. And then number three is, is cloud. So even if you're doing these I don't, IDS and backhauling traffic and doing DLP systems that involve deep packet inspection and, uh, and, and deep analysis, that's not really going to work in a cloud native world when most of your users are rocking off of Dropbox or OneDrive or Twitter or whatever. So there are a bunch of transformative things happening at one time that are allowing this inflection point where someone can say, maybe I should change my network architecture, and I think that drives some interest in zero trust. Now, as I said, I think of zero trust as a philosophy. That's re realistically what it is. And I think of it as three tenets. This is just D. Wizzle's three tenets. So the first is you don't get anything just because you're on the network. That's the simple concept. If I plug into an RJ45 jack in your network, I shouldn't be able to hit an SMB share or go to C$ admin, right? I shouldn't be able to do that. Or, uh, it, it, and in the zero trust world, we just assume anybody on the network is pwned. And that actually turns out to be a philosophy that helps a lot. It's very similar to thinking your browser tab is compromised and thus you always have to be thinking about what exploit mitigations can I apply, how do I get isolation there, et cetera, et cetera. It sort of brings that concept to the network. The second thing that's very interesting, in my opinion, is this idea of everything is rejected by default. And again, to harp on that term mandatory access control, in a world where you have a centralized proxy that understands identity and device trust, by default you're dropping all traffic. So even if I send a, a TCP packet, it should be routed through this you know, magic proxy or, uh, or segmentation gateway or whatever you want to call it. And if I cannot identify the key policy elements, so identity and device trust, it's just dropped. There is no access to resources. That's a very big change from you know, your conventional Windows network where I'm able to hop around on admin shares the second I get on the network and get a DHCP IP. Um, the third thing is you're really shifting to a model that requires two things at all times. The first is that I understand deeply who the user is, and there's a rabbit hole of that of they have the password all the way down to they're coming from a device that I specifically provisioned a key in the you know, iPhone SEP and the trust in the device. And again, that's a rabbit hole from, this device looks like it's patched from the JavaScript user agent string I read all the way down to hardware-based attestation with something like Intel TXT. But the concept is, at any given time, I can dynamically gate access based on what I know about the user and what I know about the device. And so there's a sliding scale there, which is, in the morning, maybe you had access to the Joint Strike Fighter plans, but if you clicked on the macro, you should only be able to get to the wiki that tells you how to clean that up. You should automatically uh, have dynamic security policies applied. That's a really powerful concept because today it's very binary. It's either you have access or you don't. So moving ahead, really there's three key security properties that Zero Trust claims to give us. One is attack surface reduction because we've cleaned up the network so it goes through the central hub. Ostensibly, we removed any network surface flows that were not in our control plane previously. The second, as I said, is mandatory access control. Every network flow has to be accounted for from a device trust and identity perspective. Uh, and then the third thing, which is a key component, is least privilege at all times. Only get absolutely what you need access to. That's easier said than done for anybody who's worked in identity and access management, but that's the concept here. Now, the real issue, I think, is this all probably sounds good at a high level. You're like, this is cool, but you know, Dave, what do I do here? And the reality is it's very squishy what people mean by zero trust. 
Um, in fact, I, as I said, because it's a philosophy, people can easily adopt that and say, this thing I built is zero trust. There's no RFC manual that you can look up that's gonna have a standard on this, although I'm sure somebody will try at some point. Um, but the reality is, some people are client-focused, which is your conventional enterprise network, and they're building kind of constructs or internal through uh, internal mechanisms to do that. Other folks are very focused on the on server side. I've seen lots of micro segmentation based networks where they're trying to do everything around device trust just by looking at the network traffic coming from the device. I don't advise you do that, but if you're a network centric person, maybe that's the way you do things. You wanna look at for traffic anomalies, you wanna apply IDS to the device, and if you see any weird traffic, you put that in a, a lower trust category. However, for my purposes, and again, this is, my, my, this is sort of my selfish thing, is I'm looking at what is the next generation, terrible term, but what does the next generation of client networks look like, and how can we adopt some of these philosophies? And the two major kind of solution architectures that I've seen are Google Beyond Corp, of which there's quite a few vendors uh, building stuff on, and then Microsoft's conditional access, which Again, loose terms is essentially a zero trust architecture. And so that's what I looked at when evaluating the security. So probably the easiest thing to do is to level set on what are we trying to solve here? Um, and as much as people talk about breaches, there's actually very little public information about what a real breach looks like. Normally if you get completely pwned and a bunch of IR people come into your uh, network, you don't write a blog about it. Sometimes you do, there was a great one, uh, I think by Reddit just the other week, but it's, it's very infrequent. So I modeled what I think is a canonical sort of classic uh, enterprise breach based on the CERT documentation on Grizzly Step, which is the so-called GNC hack. But it's very kind of rinse and repeat. So conceptually, you've got a bunch of devices that are in this chewy center network, right, where you've got a hardened DMZ, probably some firewalls, some IDS kind of stuff, and then internally you have a free-for-all of access to shares and transitive trust relationships, admin shares, remote method invocation, all of that good stuff. Uh, and so what we know from at least the IOCs published by US CERT and others is the initial compromise came from a link to, you guessed it, an executable which someone ran, once that, they ran that executable, they're living off the land trying to evade whatever client uh, side introspection there is there. So they're running a Python implant, which should do a lot of interpreted stuff in memory that should be harder to detect. From there, they get credentials in a very classic way. PowerShell, Mimikatz dump, nothing new here. They end up doing pass the hash and move around with a WMI based persistence mechanism as a way to get in the back door. And then they eventually exfiltrate information. So the key here is they get on one device, lateral movement, expand, breach scope, rinse and repeat, and the network is completely owned. And this is ultimately the potential value of zero trust is removing this concept or this very slippery slope from network design. So the way that Google proposes to do this is they sort of implement a few different constructs in their network. The first is they use mandatory user identity management, which could be an LDAP server, it could be a G Suite server, it could be cloud-based Active Directory, it could be a local Active Directory. As long as it's got an API where from an enforcement point I can query attributes about the user, I can probably use it. If there's single sign-on integrated, that's even better because now the identity itself becomes the control point. Anytime you log in, I can demand, or you try to access resources, I can demand that you present MFA, I can demand attributes about your identity, I can demand you come from a certain geolocation. There's a lot of control available there. The second component in the architecture is what we call a device trust and inventory. In the stuff that I reviewed, mostly that looks like an MDM, which is I know what devices are out there, I know what operating systems they ran, and I put some kind of certificate on the devices that are associated with my enterprise. That's ultimately what it looks like. The third piece, which is the, arguably the most important, is a combination of the signals having policy applied to them. So an access control engine is essentially a set of rules or heuristics that you have for your network. So a very simple one could be, for you to log into this critical mission critical business system, I need you to have macros turned off on your device, I need you to be fully patched, and I need you to have authenticated with MFA in the last 24 hours, and I need you to have you know, a TPM where I can store the device uh, identity key. 
maybe those the rules are that simple. And then the third piece is the access proxy. That is the central nervous system where all traffic flows through, and it talks directly to the access control engine for every network flow, which ultimately looks most like HTTP uh, at this point in time, and it's consulting this database and rule set to determine wh whether the traffic should be allowed. It's actually pretty simple. This is the canonical picture you'll see in just about any, any document, but it's relatively straightforward. You put everything you care about behind the access proxy, and anybody trying to touch those resources is going to have to show their identity and some information about the device they're coming from, and it has to pass policy for that access to happen. So, how do we evaluate this? Um, and I can tell you as much information as you can find about ZTN, please come up to me afterwards and show me if anybody has actually applied a threat model to see if it's worth. I, I couldn't find that. There's lots of ways I could think about this being valuable, but there didn't even seem to be a basic analysis about what is the security value of the system and would it work well. And that's never a good thing to have a bunch of people ready to spend money when we haven't actually looked to see if the thing works, at least in a way that could be independently reviewed. So it turns out that MITRE's done a pretty good thing, and I know there's lots of chat about this. We have something similar internally, which is they've published, very similar to what I showed there previously with the Grizzly SEP incident, but they've published a manual on how to emulate a common adversary, in this case, uh, you know, adversary soup APT3. Um, so what I did for the purposes of this talk to evaluate security is I took MITRE's APT3 uh, adversary emulation doctrine and I said, how would this work on a ZTN network? I went and grabbed as many solutions that were publicly available. I'm not even gonna name names because the idea is, you know, we're looking at how this works as a philosophy, not as an independent solution. Uh, and then in the mobile space, which is critical here, I looked for inspiration to incidents like Trident, which is a zero day exploit, one of the only ones we've seen, I think the only one we've seen in the wild on iOS, the X-Agent malware on Android, and Hacking Team, which was sideloaded on both uh, Android and iOS. And the concept here is I'm looking at two properties. One is, how well does a ZTN approach work for pre-exploitation? That is, how well does it work for stopping anybody from getting onto a device or getting access to an identity that's associated with a resource I care about? So it's just stopping it to begin with. The second component I looked at is post-exploitation, which is, assuming a device or an identity gets compromised, how well does a particular architecture or solution do at isolating that? to kind of the minimal impact, right? So if one machine gets compromised, ideally it would immediately lose access and it would stop any potential lateral movement. So if we look then about essentially how this would be applied in a zero trust world, here's what it looks like, again, high level conceptually and we'll dive down. So it, we'll take Grizzly Step and we'll remove everything, right? We're going zero trust cloud directly. We put the access control engine in front of the cloud or maybe even web services we own um, that we care about. We have the access control engine, we have our device inventory, and an SSO slash user directory. Conceptually, any access to that now is considered untrusted. Remember, we have mandatory access control. The access control engine and proxy will force the device and the user to prove trust for any uh, potential access request. And if the access is granted and you pass policy, everything is cool. Now, if we take the exact same grizzly step attack, conceptually, zero trust would help in a couple ways. First is, whatever the initial attack surface was, in this case, a untrusted XE being set by email, the device properties here should tell me that this device, if it, it would enable that attack, let's say it doesn't have application control or code signing enabled, shouldn't have access to anything too sensitive. Secondarily, if they were to eventually get access to this device, they shouldn't be able to dump credentials and laterally move. One, because I've removed all transitive trusts in my network, I'm now going through the access proxy, and two, the credentials themselves would hopefully be subject, hopefully be subject to a policy that would make credential theft hard. So maybe you're running um, Credential Guard from Microsoft, Maybe you're uh, mandating the use of U2F keys, which is always a good idea. Whatever your identity protection scheme is should make lateral movement hard. So we, we end that. Uh, and now that the device has been infected in one way or another, it should actually be put onto an island and there should be no, no more resources. So this is the, the conceptual model. The reality is it's kind of a cool story, cool story, but does this actually work? That's, that's the real question. <laughs> 
So let's look at this a little bit. So the first, and I would argue the most critical in my opinion, at least critical and I don't think we've gone very far here, is how do we establish device trust in a way that would be meaningful for this attack? So let's talk about what we're trying to achieve there. So there are a couple properties for device trust that we want. The first is properties that would help us in the pre-breach situation. The first thing that's arguably the most simple is we want to identify devices that are associated with our enterprise group, home network, whatever that is. So we want to strongly identify those devices. That mitigates the threat or it mitigates the control we're giving up because we're now essentially saying, yeah, anybody come talk to my open web service, but one of the things you, you would do to establish trust is, is this a device I know about? That's the first layer of defense. Not just anybody can come onto uh, or make a request to my network if they haven't got a device that I know about. The second component, and this is kind of interesting from my perspective, is patch state. So ideally, a part of tr uh, device trust would say, you are, your device is patched, right, mitigating hopefully exploitation and other threats uh, before it gets access to any critical resources. The third pre-breach help is something we'll just call like the security profile of the device. So you might be able to mitigate, say, data loss attacks by mandating um, at rest encryption. You might be able to mitigate macro attacks by saying you have to use exploit guard or some other GP policy to disable macros on this machine before it talks to my network. The list can go on. You could require you know, virtualization based security if you're running a, a Windows device. Uh, and so all of that prevents the attack from happening and that's the primary security value. And I trust this device, that, that's a concept, I trust this device because the, the risk that it's gonna get actually pwned is somehow lower because of these three properties. The fourth thing is what we'll call runtime integrity, which is post-breach. Um, this is actually sorely lacking and I'll talk about this, but all of these three things are facts I know are properties about the device, but I can just easily boot up a machine, pass all of these de uh, device priorities or device properties, and someone can pwn me, right? They can send me code, uh, it could be a zero day exploit, and the device is hosed. So we wanna have some affordance for that by also having runtime integrity. So just because the device booted up trusted doesn't mean it should be trusted forever or even for a very long time without runtime verification. So the goal with runtime verification is remove access or re uh, reduce the trust level if the device has been popped. So how do people do device authentication in practice in zero trust implementations? Again, my taxonomy here was to cruise around the web and grab every solution I could get my hands on across a bunch of platforms and test them out. Uh, and so what I actually found is for most devices, people are using simple X509 uh, authentication mechanism. So this, it looks something like this, is they're getting an X509 CA certificate, sometimes it's self-signed, sometimes they're getting it from an actual CA. They're setting up their PKI inf infrastructure with uh, intermediate CAs, and then they're generally using an MDM, or in some cases their own software agent, to plop that X509 cert down in software on the device, and remember this includes a private key, sometimes it's password protected and sometimes it's not, and that is how they are establishing the first property which is, is this my corporate or enterprise device or not? So you have the software X509 and in the best case scenarios, there are people using TPMs and the AIK or the endorsement key in the TPM as a hardware rooted anchor for device authentication. That's a much better situation. So the question is, is assuming again, back to the Grizzly step or whatever the APT3 scenario, how would that help us in practice? In practice, it's incredibly trivial to take most of these authentication mechanisms and, and export the device identity, move it on to an attacker's device, et cetera, uh, and kind of do your thing. Uh, and the reason for that is, in a lot of cases, I think for convenience, people doing things like provisioning through their MDMs are just kind of pushing these certs out. They don't necessarily have a, a heterogeneous uh, kind of uh, hardware environment where they can guarantee TPMs are gonna be in place. Maybe they support TPMs, but they don't support uh, key storage on Android. It's very hard in practice to actually do this to get the keys out. So in a lot of cases, we have a software fallback. Now, if you're storing this key using, say, uh, uh, Windows API mechanisms, the best you can do in software is say, please don't export this Windows. 
But of course, um, Benjamin and other people have proven that that's probably, you know, not that hard to inject code into um, CNG or others to patch things out and voila, you can export certificates. It's a similar situation on Android, which is, um, Android actually has some really excellent mechanisms for d uh, storing keys and other things. Uh, and I actually reference a paper here where someone did an analysis of, you know, what is the threat model that's resistant if you store keys in software on Android or the various mechanisms. And we can actually see storing, say, in the key store using a Qualcomm T is actually fairly resilient to export um, and access the keys, but we don't see that in practice, in my experience, looking at some of these vendors. So, um, again, that doesn't mean this is a blanket statement across the board. Some people were storing in TPMs, but even in the cases where they were storing the device uh, identification key in the TPM, in most cases, there was no way to attest to it. So it was like, I'll try the TPM, but if it doesn't happen, you'll never know. Um, that is not ideal. Uh, and this is a general blanket statement, which is device authentic authentication, I think, is a very good security property, but in practice, it's actually hard to do uh, in a way that's meaningful. So it turns out that Windows had a slightly be better mechanism for doing this that almost anybody can extend. And so I did want to talk about that for a second. The first is uh, we have a, a device attestation service called the device health attestation that is extensible by most MDMs uh, and actually has some API and some extensibility constructs that people can use. And the way that that works is we start with a TPM where the endorsement key that uniquely identifies the device is actually stored in the TPM at factory time. And in the Windows space, we actually have a new program called Autopilot where that device straight from the factory can be shipped to your door. And eventually you'd actually have the ability to measure in the factory PCR or the, the factory firmware into a PCR and compare it to what it was on the factory floor. So if you're a real uh, kind of a tinfoil hat person, you could actually establish supply chain uh, integrity from the factory all the way to your door, which means you would have some trust uh, in this device authentication key. Now, it's a fairly simple and straightforward service. What the service does is it uh, forces a secret that only lives in the TPM to be signed um, using the private key in the TPM, and proof that you uh, are able to sign that key will allow you to set up the device in a way that we can guarantee that the identity AIK key is not compromised and is exactly what we would expect from the TPM. Android has very similar architecture with Keymaster, which provides hardware back attestation in a trust zone T. Uh, and iOS and iMac have the ability to do something very similar in the secure enclave. So there are better ways of doing it. Uh, this is just one example, but in practice, even though these affordances are on the platforms, at least on the PC side, we're not seeing it done. On the mobile side, from my perspective, things look better there. So the second property we wanted to look at was uh, assessing patch state. This was actually very interesting, which is most of the patch state I saw was incredibly rudimentary. So in the lower right-hand corner in Windows, we have an API that goes all the way back to the network access control days, remember 802.11x, NAC, where you could say things like, if you don't have antivirus, you can't join the Wi-Fi, stuff like that. Um, I saw vendors basically using this, which at best it would tell you like, Windows was patched in the last 30 days, which might be okay, but if you've got other vulnerable apps on the, on the system, that's not gonna tell you a ton. It'll tell you things like if you have UAC installed, very basic things, uh, and a lot of cases this was the sole source of identifying the patch state of the device, which I think um, is, is, is not sufficient. Uh, in other cases, I saw vendors using JavaScript to establish the trust of a Windows device, so saying things like, are you Windows 10 just from the user agent? Or is your Java up to date? Cool, like you're, you're patched, right? And in reality, when we're talking about things like macro attacks or, or um, if you've got a third party binary on the device, you're not gonna be able to assess that simply from, from the web. Uh, and so that makes things incredibly difficult when you're, you're saying I, I have trust in this device um, if it's that simple to tamper. 
both Duo and Microsoft and Defender ATP have an interesting construct, which is kind of scoring the risk of the device. Uh, and that's a very nice aggregate metric because in reality, I don't know many enterprises that are gonna sit down and author 65 security properties that they want to be true for you to access the wiki. So this aggregate score kind of gives you a way to say, just figure this all out for me, and as long as the device is 85% or better, or whatever that is, um, allow it to be trusted. But certainly in the patch case, we're seeing a lot to be desired, and even when you have maybe a good vulnerability management solution or something that would give you a data set about the device, in my experience, and again, I didn't look at everything out there, there was a lot of things that were behind kind of um, sales calls or whatever, and I wasn't willing to do those, um, I haven't seen a lot of ro more robust vulnerability management solutions supplying the data that a zero trust implementation around device state would be able to use. So let's talk about what it might look like to have a better um, uh, trust anchor. Uh, on Windows devices, there's four or five different hardware rooted capabilities that we can use to at least raise the bar a bit. The bar right now is run Mimikatz, play around with Fiddler and JavaScript or, or things like that, which is not a very high bar when it comes to device trust. Um, the first is obviously uh, Eufy Secure Boot gives us the capability to determine if the firmware on the device and the bootloader run are brought up together are as the manufacturer and the OS uh, system vendor intended. Those are critical capabilities to know uh, kind of baseline, can I trust this device? The second component, as we already talked about, is the TPM and the ability to do both key attestation there as well as uh, store secrets uh, segmented from the operating system. Going forward on the latest Windows uh, and future Windows devices, we have something even better, which is Intel's TXT and Skinit, which I'm going to go into in just a moment. Intel's TXT and Skinit allow us to actually measure the uh, bootloader and other key operating system constructs without taking a dependency, trusting <laughs> UFI vendors, um, assuming that those UFI vendors might have vulnerabilities in their firmware, uh, which is happening more and more often. And the third bit that we can use as a trust anchor in hardware is Intel's VTX, VTD, and the similar equivalents from AMD and Qualcomm, which will allow us to create an isolated code segment for things like trusted code and secrets that we can use to assess the security of the device or at least reduce its risk profile. So putting this together into an attestation solution uh, is actually relatively powerful, at least when we're talking about boot properties. So in this simple animation from the hardware uh, at the factory uh, using Secure Boot, we can uh, attest to the bootloader being signed by the manufacturer's uh, requirements, the platform owner. Uh, we can use that to create a trust change and load the Windows Boot Manager. Once we get into WinLoad, we can measure the hashes of all the code that start on the device into these uh, PC configuration registers, uh, so on and so forth. So in the end, what we're able to do is say that the basic components of the operating systems that are absolutely required, the engine in the car, is running as intended. If you can't have these things, then there is zero way for you to establish trust in the device, because essentially at that point, any property that you would measure remotely would be immutable. Using these PCRs, we can actually sign a report using the uh, endorsement key in the TPM, and we can write that into something called the TCG log, or the Trusted Computing Group log. So what we end up with is a list of properties, things like, is code integrity running on this device? Is there a kernel debugger? Um, is the UFI code signed? What is the current operating system version? Is this the version of the kernel that came from Microsoft? All good stuff, and you can use that and send that signal up to a cloud service, in this case, the device health attestation server, and you can use that as a signal into your access proxy to determine access. Sounds pretty good, right? So. Definitely the device health attestation service, which is extensible and many MDMs use it, but there's still things that we could do better. What are those things? Well, first is the, the uh, implementation I showed you here has complete trust on the UFI code in the devices it's running on, at least on the PC side. Uh, if you follow kind of security news and the amount of CVEs flowing and exploitation happening in UFI and the challenges with updating that, that is not a good best a bet, especially if you're betting on zero trust and hardware-rooted security. The second challenge with DHA is its boot time. 
all the action, in my opinion, when we look at breaches actually happens at runtime. So saying this device booted up healthy and it's hardware rooted is not super useful against a macro attack. I can like bring up virtualization based security, but if somebody still clicks on that exe, it doesn't really matter. And the third challenge with increasing device trust is ostensibly AV and maybe an EDR solution would be able to kind of tell us what's happening on the device at runtime. But those are all trivially subverted with attacks against things like PPL, loading uh, um, drivers that are uh, vulnerable but signed, and various other mechanisms for tampering mean that a software component in the best of circumstances is difficult to use as a trust anchor. The, one of the things that I wanted to point out was in our own testing internally at Microsoft, we evaluated the security of device health attestation. While we found it pretty good, we also identified, as I said, SMM as a critical area for improvement and an area that attackers can target. Because so much of our security infrastructure is based on virtualization-based security and the ability to hide secrets and trusted code across a hypervisor boundary, SMM turns out to be the lowest hanging fruit in that world. It's the lagging gazelle. It's the place you can target. So both external researchers and the internal Windows Red team, when they want to compromise devices, they're generally looking at the UFI code available at runtime, or SMM, uh, as a mechanism for attacking the hypervisor. So one of the uh, kind of examples I wanted to show here was uh, back when we sh originally shipped Windows 10 with Device Guard, the internal red team looked at a Surface Pro 3 at the time, actually found a trivial stack overflow and an SMI handler in SMM. The impact of this was you triggering an SMI handler from kernel, and they already had kernel code execution with a kernel exploit, uh, they were able to completely overwrite SMM memory and use that to tamper with the hypervisor, eventually leading to leaking credentials from Credential Guard. So Credential Guard has a strong dependency on SMM security. Uh, obviously, we fixed that vulnerability, to sh we're able to ship that out, and then we looked at other devices. Uh, a couple of CVs I linked out uh, related to Lenovo devices as well, but this is a very common pattern throughout the industry. And so the general concern here is, it's nice to have hardware-rooted security, but it's currently subverted by limitations in trust in SMM. So how do we solve that problem? The first way we solve that problem is by moving to a boot mechanism that no longer has a static root of trust, that has a dependency on the UFI vendor or firmware vendor writing perfect code, which is hard to do. The way that we do that is by using uh, the Intel TXT extensions to implement what's called dynamic root of trust, or DRTM. And DRTM is relatively simple. The concept is allow UFI secure boot to work as it is, but when we get to the point where we're loading operating system components, let's load a, a piece of code called an MLE, or a measured launch environment, that's guaranteed by an ACM, which is written by Intel and signed only to run on Intel's hardware, so it's trusted, and trigger what's called an, uh, uh, an, an SNIC call to start to measure that code into a PCR. And the idea here is we can link both unsealing of secrets, that is, like the ability to whether or not to decrypt the device using something like BitLocker, as well as device health based on a uh, dependency only on Microsoft and Intel code. So we took the trust circle from every vendor out there with all the permutations of firmware code to just Microsoft and Intel, which wrote the chipset and wrote the operating system. That is a dramatic reduction in the attack surface and can give us a lot more confidence that we're at least we're bringing up the device in a healthy way. Uh, and so in an upcoming version of Windows, we'll be shipping DRTM uh, as a, a mechanism in boot, uh, and we will also be exposing the ability to test that remotely, which is a critical factor in building a real tr zero trust device. Now, when I introduced this, I kind of uh, uh, boasted like, this is real zero trust, we're getting rid of uh, uh, firmware dependencies, and that's because I'd been involved in so many of these internal and external operations where SMM had been used to attack the hypervisor and other mechanisms. And so I went, this is super cool, we don't have trust. And rightfully so, a couple of really smart folks pointed out, you know, Dave, that is cool that you have TXT, but you still have a dependency on SMM in these cases. Uh, and they pointed out a few older uh, uh, research papers by Joanna Rotowska and others 
which pointed out that there's a very strong linkage between TXT and SMM security. And one of the reasons is, is SMM is running at such a privilege level, we call it really ring minus two, that has the ability to tamper uh, essentially any code running on the device. Uh, and so the mechanism for defeating that is, is, is not simple. So when I announced that t we might have a mechanism for doing this in the future, uh, Alex Tershirkin, uh, who is a, a really awesome researcher, pointed out like, so are you gonna force uh, OEMs or uh, kind of device vendors to run in what's called STM or a reduced sort of functionality, a reduced privilege version of SMM? And so he got really excited about that. Uh, and I actually poked on my Intel buddies and said, every time I talk about DRTM, super smart researchers point out that we got the strong dependency on SMM and we're working on something together, can I talk about it? And so for Black Hat, I, I got them to, to allow me to do that. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things we've been cooking up with Intel uh, in the SMM space. The first thing is uh, Intel Runtime BIOS Resilient, which is essentially, in, in my mind, a stripped down version of STM. So it guarantees a few security properties about SMM. One is all of the code running in SMM uh, it has locked down page tables and cannot map or modify operating system memory at all. Uh, so they use page tables uh, and translation mechanisms to prevent access to the hypervisor or OS memory, which are critical, because conceptually what you're doing is compromising into SMM, and then the first thing you want to do is allow an arbitrary read or write to hypervisor or other operating system memory to tamper with it. That's the key value proposition of M SMM. And the second component is that we can attest to the fact that a machine is running Intel BIOS runtime resilience. So the combination of SMM attestation, SMM paging protections, and DRTM means we can have a full Windows device boot up with trust that even malicious SMM code, uh, if it's present, has a restricted ability to touch the hypervisor or other constructs. So that's super critical and something we can work into the zero trust implementations. Now, I mentioned previously that the other issue that we have with establishing device trust, at least on Windows devices, is the key, thing, the key kind of data that we want to get is what's coming from the AV or EDR. So if you have a PowerShell attack on the device, if you have a phishing attack, um, whatever attack is happening on the device, your best optics into that and your best mechanism of establishing trust are probably gonna come from an AV or an EDR that you've invested in. The challenge with those, and it was pointed out last year uh, at Black Hat by a researcher from IBM is that even PPL, or the protected process in the Microsoft platform, can be relatively easily subverted using a, a kernel driver, in this case, Mimikatz, or a kernel driver that maybe was signed validly at one point but had a vulnerability but hasn't been revoked. Using those, you can perform memory corruption on the PPL bit in what's called the e-process structure uh, and use that to restore the full capability to inject code, read and write memory uh, in a protected process. So, the best we offer today on the Windows platform for any AV or software agent is PPL, uh, and if that's going to have challenges in terms of security, uh, it's going to make it very difficult to trust the signals coming from this in a zero trust implementation. So, we came up with a solution for this, because we want to be able to do Premier Zero Trust on Windows platform, uh, and that solution was what we're calling Windows Runtime uh, 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 system or Windows Run System Guard, <laughs> sorry, System Guard runtime attestation, which is a mechanism for measuring key security properties of the device from inside of the hypervisor. Some of those key properties will allow us to determine things like if there's a software agent running on your machine protected by PPL, has it had code injected into it? Has PPL been removed? It essentially allows us, without moving the entire AV or EDR stack into the hypervisor, to have hardware rooted trust. So let me explain a little bit more about how that works. So uh, as I mentioned, CT, uh, System Guard runtime attestation leverages virtualization-based security to run its code in a hypervisor segmented area of the operating system that we call virtual trust level one. So there's a sensor that runs in there as a user land process. It has a scriptable runtime based on Lua that allows us to measure from a privileged position everything happening in the normal world operating system. So conceptually, one way to think about this is, imagine if you had like someone running forensics on your machine at all times, volatility, et cetera, but they're behind a boundary that even a kernel exploit cannot violate. That's a critical security property and an advantage. Uh, 
uh, allows us to hardware root what we're seeing. Uh, and system guard uh, runtime assessation allows these scripts, which are, can be dynamically loadable, to be improved over time and measure more and more of the critical operating system space. Um, so the system guard runtime broker can walk around, it can measure things like, do you have code integrity on this device? Was there memory corruption on the e-process bit that uh, establishes PPL or process isolation for, say, the AV? It can determine things like, did the firewall on this device get shut off? Was there a known kernel driver that provides read-write access to the kernel loaded, et cetera, et cetera? There is actually an API that will allow an arbitrary client, pick your, your favorite uh, zero trust client, to call into System Guard API and receive a TPM signed report about what's happening in the device. And so you're able to do things like call into the API, get a set of assertions coming back about whether the machine's been tampered or not, and then use that in the cloud in your access, prox uh, in your access proxy to establish whether or not this device now meets the trust level that you expect. So that is really cool because Again, assuming that we brought things up with TXT, that we've got SMM attestation, that we brought up the virtualization-based security environment, and that we're completely hardware rooted at this point, it's a very difficult to tamper with me mechanism for independently measuring the device trust, and in combination, relatively powerful. So let's talk really quickly about how this would work in practice. So let's take an arbitrary attacker process, let's call it Mimikatz, we load a driver that's signed but vulnerable into the kernel. VBox, Capcom, CPU-Z are all commonly used by tools you can grab on GitHub. The attacker process now has a read-write mechanism in the kernel. They can corrupt things like the e-process, driver dispatch, process mitigations, whatever they want to do. The Octagon agent or the system guard agent will measure those, report them back to the Octagon agent, and then the arriving party which can be an access proxy or a, uh, a zero trust enforcement point in the cloud, can establish that. I'm gonna kind of run through this. We will, we don't have yet, but we will in the short future, Microsoft will be providing an API that anybody can use for this. It's relatively simple. You establish a session with the agent running in VTL1. You can exchange keys and attestation back with that agent to make sure that it's reporting from hardware, and then you can continuously call runtime reports to get a, a view of what's happening on the device um, that is relatively uh, difficult to tamper with. So let's quickly look at uh, how this works in practice. So I'm going to, in this case, pick on the MSP engine, which is the Microsoft Defender engine. Uh, you can see here that it is protected in the PPL, which again will prevent you from doing things like read or write process memory, uh, stopping the service, things that we don't want to happen when we're using it as a key mechanism for trust. I'm going to uh, quickly show you how we can, from PowerShell, call into the system guard runtime agent and get some information about the device. So again, this is the kind of API that a zero trust agent would be able to call into. Um, if we look at the payload return, we've just made a call into the API to get information from BSM on this machine about the device security properties. A Couple of things we can see that are cool here are we've got code integrity enabled, we've got VSM enabled, we're running a TPM, we don't have a debugging uh, 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 port enabled, we have secure boot on the device, all of those critical properties. Now, an attacker who wants to tamper with PPL would first probably need to load a driver. Uh, in this case, we'll try to load a, the striker tool, which is essentially a tool that loads the CPU-Z driver and allows e-process to be corrupted. Uh, our process is 4508. We tried to run that, but because we have pre-breach protection through HVCI, when we look at the log, we can actually see, it just takes a second that the driver load was actually blocked. Give that a second, I'll come back there. So the driver load was blocked. So we're forced to think of another mechanism because of pre-breach protection for HVCI for tampering with this process. So that's uh, actually, uh, there's a relatively straightforward path for that. 
So we can modify the striker tool to just read the location of the process in memory and we'll use an alternative mechanism for tampering it. So we've just read the location and here's an address where our PPL bit lives in memory. If we remove this bit, we can now tamper with the agent anchoring trust uh, and the device will be difficult to trust at this point. One thing I want to show you is that the device is clean now. So all of our in measurements in kernel memory are good. Everything is nice and good to go. So we'll now use Roke, which is a recently released tool that allows you to tamper with kernel memory. So using Roke, we'll take that same PPL address, we'll write a zero. Oops. And we've now removed PPL. You can see protection is none there. Now we can actually read and write memory. We can see all of the modules. Basically, we control this device. So in a software anchored world, this is challenging. But let's see how uh, System Guard Runtime Attestation helps with this. So we'll rerun our attestation components. And now if we look at the same assertions, you can actually see that from hardware, we were able to see that the, the agent was tampered with. That signal will now go up to a zero trust cloud and prevent access. So that's a, just one way in which we are helping to do hardware anchoring. Running out of time here, but I quickly wanted to point out that other platforms have similar uh, attribution quality. So iOS is a great uh, example of a device that has hardware rooted trust. However, attestation on the iOS platform is currently really challenging. You're forced to do it from a user application from the store, which is running in a sandbox. Uh, and at best, what that generally looks like is looking for file paths on the device um, uh, to determine if it's rooted or not. Uh, and of course, attackers have a fairly simple mechanism of hooking out those calls um, using code inject. In fact, I used uh, a couple of commonly available apps, GL Protect and Liberty Light, um, that would defeated most of the zero trust agents I had on a rooted iPhone. Uh, and so that's incredibly challenging. Just looking at the code here, we can see those uh, hooks are happening. So just about out of time here, so I wanted to kind of summarize the learnings. So does it work? Now, unfortunately, I didn't get to the identity section, but the reality is zero trust is incredibly uh, promising, and I believe that the mandatory access control mechanism for the network would be very useful. The major challenge today is that a lot of the ingredients that are on the table, but we haven't put together a recipe that would expose those to zero trust vendors in a way that they would capably impact attacks on uh, Android, iOS, or Windows devices. Uh, we're making a lot of steps, especially in identity space, by extending out U2F tokens and the WebAuth end spec that would allow you to have more hardware uh, or stronger integrity and in, uh, user identity along with uh, uh, hardware trust. But currently, most of the solutions today make use of very simple software mechanisms like I showed today that are trivial to tamper with. So uh, in reality, moving forward, as platforms increase and there's more extensibility and the ability to test to those platforms, we will see the ability to do meaningful full device trust skyrocket, and in combination with identity solutions, whether that be G Suite or AAD and multi-factor authentication, with the move to the cloud, I think there's a pretty bright future for ZTN, but it's not there now. <laughs>